Welcome to the Legally Speaking Podcast. You are now listening to Season 7 of the show. I'm your host, Rob Hanna. This week, I'm delighted to be joined by Harry Borovic. Harry is the General Counsel at Luminance, a London-headquartered AI company that is automating legal processes for over 500 companies worldwide, including the likes of Tesco's Coke and Lamborghini. In addition to managing Luminance's own legal and compliance requirements, he also works to advise on development and user experience. Harry trained in private practice at Mishkondorea before going on to work on a range of regulated technology businesses with a focus on the US and UK markets. Prior to Luminance, Harry led the UK legal function for the NASDAQ-listed ad tech company LiveRamp. A keen user and advocate for AI, Harry has spoken at major conferences, including the Economist, General Counsel Summit, and Legal Geek. Harry is a visiting lecturer at the University of Law, Bloomsbury, and visiting scholar of law at the University of Edinburgh. So a very warm welcome, Harry. Hi, Rob. Good to be here. Ah, It's an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. And I know we share a lot of mutual friends from previous guests and people in the community. So excited about this one. But before we go into all your amazing projects, experiences, and what you're getting up to, we do have a customary icebreaker question here on the Legally Speaking podcast, which is on the scale of one to 10, 10 being very real, what would you rate the hit TV series Suits in terms of its reality if you've seen it? Yes, I've seen a couple of episodes only. I'm going to give it a five, uh, mostly because I think lawyers in real life are much better looking. (laughs) But the thing that is very real is the scenes where you see paralegals and junior lawyers flipping through thousands of documents through the night till five in the morning. The thing that's unrealistic is when they find the answer that night. Yeah, I think five's fair comment, and uh, absolutely yourself included in the uh, the glamorous lawyers. I'm, I'm putting that on the record for you. Um, so let's let's talk all about you today. That's why you're here. Would you mind telling our listeners about your background and career journey? Yeah, sure. So I'm now the general counsel at a legal tech company called Luminance. But going way back, I originally uh, ran my family business, joined it with my dad, uh, which is a textile business. We're the oldest family owned business in Soho. Um, So we have been in the same hands since 1932. Um, And I grew up working that, helping my dad own that business uh, internationally and was working through that whilst I was at law school. It was fantastic and a really good grounding in sort of what it means to work in a quote unquote real business uh, that deals with real customers, um, happy ones and grumpy ones. And that was fantastic. Um, after we sold the business in 2009, I think 14, um, I went to school and went and trained at Michigan de Rare and had a great time there, but very quickly knew that private practice probably wasn't where I wanted to stay. So I sort of quite transparently made my training contract about learning everything I could that would probably serve me in an in-house career. Um, And I really loved anything that was regulated. So I did lots of um, sort of advisory work and learning about advisory support, both financial regulatory, corporate regulatory, whatever it may be, and got really good exposure to gaming and tech. Uh, We're really lucky. There were some great partners at Mishcon who were very generous with this trainee with his hands out begging for interesting work and they uh, engaged with me which was lovely um, and then when I qualified I went into which uh, like the consumer group which is actually I think it might still be now but at the time it was definitely the biggest uh, consumer subscription uh, group in the UK it had like a million subscribers and they're quite an interesting business because they were set up to by an act of parliament essentially they're technically a charity to protect the consumer, i.e. to give independent consumer advice, consumer information. They even do class action litigation on behalf of consumers, really wide remit. And because I'd done some regulatory work before, uh, because they're a charity, they're quite constrained by budget. And they wanted to set up a regulated mortgage and insurance broker, uh, but they probably basically didn't want to spend the money on a more senior regulatory lawyer. And they were like, you fancy giving this a shot? And as a newly qualified lawyer, that was terrifying. Uh, with, with, I mean, great lawyers, great team, and great general supervision. But in terms of financial regulatory, none. And that was great. We set that up, worked on that. 
um, and worked generally as a commercial lawyer across that business. And it was an incredible opportunity. And then once that had been done, essentially, I thought I'd done what I'd set out to do, do something I'd not done before. Uh, I then went to a company called Canby. And Canby was interesting because I was involved in anything gaming regulatory when I was at Michigan quite heavily, including um, sports betting and gambling tech. And in 2018, the US, um, uh, the Supreme Court uh, ruled that the nationwide ban on sports betting was unconstitutional. And so Canby was a algorithmic tech company which supported uh, gaming companies in Europe. And then there was this basically this race in the US to be who could get the first license to take the first bet in the US. And Canby was the company that took the first bet. They, they were the sort of the back end of a company called DraftKings, which is more people, more of your listeners will likely know. And I was involved in sort of getting the first permanent license, getting licensed in, basically it was done state by state in the US. So for a, a British lawyer, with limited experience, but supporting some other lawyers and then getting loads of local advice in a territory that you don't really know and speaking to you know, government officials and regulators. It was, you know, it was like one year qualified, so terrifying and fantastic. And then Canby grew enormously as a result of this, as you probably imagine, because it was sort of first to market growth. And basically, because New Jersey did that first transaction, every other state broadly replicated the New Jersey model. So suddenly, for every company, the easiest sort of like the path of least resistance was to try and replicate New Jersey. And for every company who wanted to get licenses and start doing business, they were like, well, let's use the provider that did it in New Jersey. So can be grew hugely. And then I was in this very lucky position where I was very junior, but because I'd sort of done it before, the practical relevant experience was basically non-existent. There were essentially basically the people that can be but the only people who'd done it. And it was great. I had amazing mentors when I was there. And they allowed me an enormous amount of thought and freedom. And they're one of the reasons I was so passionate about mentorship, because some of the people there are still mentors to me. Um, and then that was amazing. So I did that for a couple of years. Um, and I ended up in this position where I was managing loads of lawyers, the team grew hugely. And I was still relatively junior in PQE, which was odd. But that took me into another regulated space. I got approached by a company called LiveRamp. LiveRamp uh, is essentially an ad tech company. And Google announced, so very similar to like the, the, the Supreme Court point, is like, like a big event uh, sort of drags me in. Um, Google announced that they were going to be deprecating the cookie and removing it from Google Chrome, which they still haven't actually done, even though they said they would do it four years ago. <laughs> uh, but it's on its way. And so lots of companies started to try and be first to market or sort of first to gain a foothold in the market to be the main like sort of consent based replacement for cookies in terms of like the advertising space on the internet. And LiveRamp was one of the market leaders for that. I think it's still one of the biggest um, and was fantastic. And the EMEA GC wanted a regional head of legal for the UK because the, most of the team was based in Paris. And they said, uh, you know, the job was advertised way above my PQE. Um, and they just said, actually, well, we think your relevant experience, you know, uncharted regulatory um, sort of uh, paths are sort of what you're used to. And maybe your, re your relevant experience is probably more valuable than someone with more years on the clock, but a similar amount of relevant experience or even less, therefore better value. And it was the first time I'd actually had someone basically say, we'll pay you for what you're worth, not what we can, not what we can get away with paying you. So they advertised the role at much more senior in terms of salary, in terms of everything. And they just said, no, no, you're either going to do the role well and we'll keep you on, or this is not going to work out and it's going to be a pretty, pretty quick time for you. Um, so I was there, thankfully, for a good couple of years, had an amazing time. They gave me an enormous amount of scope to start building our team, grow there. The business did fantastically. I loved working with my colleagues there. And again, another great mentor in the EMEA GC there who really sort of molded me, but allowed me to sort of find my own mold. Um, and that was great. But whilst I was there, we had some interesting experiences, I'll put it that way, with some legal tech, difficulties in implementation. I'd also done some consulting along the way for another legal tech company. And um, the COO of Luminance just reached out to me out the blue, power of LinkedIn, and said, oh, I've seen you involved in 
like talking relatively publicly about some stuff, being interviewed by some legal techs. We're looking for our first permanent PC. Would you be interested in having a conversation? And my advice to anyone who's listening who may be less experienced is always have, the, always take the call, always have the conversation. You can always say no. Um, and they really made a business case to have me and sold me on the product more importantly than anything. You know, there's no point joining a company where you think mm, this is not really going to work out or I'm going to be fighting fires because things don't work. Um, and it just made sense. Uh, it was fantastic. So that brings us to the current day where I've been at Luminance just over a year um, and having a ball. Great. Well, there's quite a lot to unpack there. And I, it sounds like I want to kind of give our listeners some, some, some of my thoughts and reflections on that. Firstly, I love that you're prepared to chuck yourself into the deep end. I love that you strategically engineered your career in many respects when you talked about your, your training contract. I love that you talk about the importance, and it's something we talk a lot about on the show, is mentors and mentorship and how they can help shape your career. LinkedIn, networking, NSN, never stop networking. I keep saying to people, that's a great example there. And I also love that you grow into your role and you don't let the roles outgrow you. So be scared, you know, go in because there's only the only place you're going to go is hope to grow and you're going to thrive. And you're a great example of that. So thank you for sharing that whole story. I want to kind of unpack a few bits and, and go back a little bit. It's almost like studying this because you initially studied uh, international relations before going on to study the law. So where did your interest in the law actually stem from? Well, that's an excellent setup, Rob, because I know you know the answer to this. <laughs> but uh, I originally, like, you know, uh, I one of the reasons I originally didn't want to be a lawyer is because my dad, as a kid, always told me I'd be a good lawyer. And I, But my dad left school at 14, didn't know what it really meant to be a lawyer. I think he was just saying that. And like any kid who has a rebellious streak, as soon as your parents start telling you you should do something, you say absolutely not. Um, I ended up because I enjoyed language. Um, I really wanted to be a speechwriter, actually, um, whether political or otherwise. So I did an international relations in Birmingham, had a great time. Um, but on my first day there, I met a guy called Oliver Haddock, who I think has been on the podcast before and who you know. And Ollie. And I had a very blunt conversation in the summer after graduating. Where I said, good God, what am I going to do now? What should we do? Um, and I had lost sort of my interest in being a speechwriter. I'd done some work experience that sort of showed you the reality of the work. And it wasn't as glamorous as I'd imagined. It wasn't really like the thick of it or anything like that. And he just said, well, I just don't want to work yet. So I might just take another year, go do the GDL, do a law conversion. and." see what comes of that. I thought, that sounds all right. So before I knew it, I was at law school with him in postgrad, becoming a lawyer and Ollie and I still good friends. So um, yeah, very lucky to have the right people putting ideas in your mind at the right time. Uh, and thankfully, it stuck. And actually, it was a great idea because even if I mean, law has loads of transferable skills. And it was the kind of thing where actually, what's the worst that could happen by doing this? I was still working on my family business whilst doing it. So financially, it made sense. Uh, like The GDL was like very intensive, but it meant it was in central London where my family business was. So it meant I could do both. It was a great idea. So it, yeah, thanks, Ollie, if you're listening. <laughs> Ollie, I'm sure you're listening. Yeah, Harry is putting on the record. He'd like to thank you. But I think there's a great message there as well in terms of, you know, you are the some of the parts of the people you hang around and, you know, they do share ideas or things even at the university days that can help shape your career for the future. So I um, really like that story. Um, I want to talk about your training contract. You talked about it before, how you almost managed to engineer a training contract. A, it's very hard to get a training contract. B, people sometimes don't get the seats that they particularly like. So from your experience, how did you manage? Is there any tips, tricks, or suggestions you would say to people about the sort of TC and then trying to get the seats that you want, knowing where you may want to take the yeah, I mean, talk about the hard to get a training contract. I think it's probably even harder now. But to give you an idea is I was never the most purely academically gifted, never had the best grades. I was OK. Um, and weirdly, commercial awareness was one of these things that lots of law firms gave sort of lip service to at the time, but weren't really acting. So often when I'd apply for training contracts or back schemes, the pushback was, oh, we don't actually think you're that interested, that dedicated in becoming a lawyer because you've got all these other interests. Um, and I thought that was bonkers, personally. But I, if you include 
everything that was like a work placement training contract, uh, a work placement vac scheme, anything like that. I did a total of 20 different placements, right, to get my training contract, four of which were at Mishcons. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I did two individual work placements and two VAC schemes. Um, and the sort of joke was the partner, I think his name is Daniel Levy, who spoke to me in my final interview. He's like, look, this is the fourth time that you've had sort of this kind of conversation, the second time at the end of a VAC scheme. Um, what is going to, if the answer is no today, what's next for you? And I said, I'll see you next year. And uh, I got, I got, I, I got the phone call that day being like, okay, we're going to offer you a training contract. And like, you know, my dad cried and all the rest. It was very lovely. But there is something to be said for just persistence if you really know what you want. Um, but the point is, you have to really know what you want. And the only way I could allay any concerns about how focused I was on trying to become a lawyer was by demonstrating that persistence because what sort of masochist would do that to themselves over and over if they didn't really want it? And I think that's kind of where we got to. In terms of the actual training contract itself, I picked my seats based on mentors. So although I did pick the skill seats that I thought would suit me in terms of a future career, there were some others which might have even been better. Like I was actually quite interested in doing an employment seat, for example. But I hadn't found anyone during my time there where I thought this is a person who the dynamic between us, because you essentially had to pitch to a lot, you know, you have to go and talk to the next department that you want to take you on, etc. And there wasn't the synergy several times that I thought this is a dynamic where I'm going to learn the most, even if the subject area is right for me. So there is sort of finding the fit in teaching. And sometimes actually when you're in the seat, that dynamic isn't what you envisaged anyway. Like I had a couple where it didn't quite go as well as I'd hoped, or it, the dynamic was quite different than I'd hoped, or maybe the partner who sort of made the decision to bring me into the team wasn't necessarily the person I was working with the most. So things like that are unpredictable, but that doesn't mean you can't sort of hedge your bets and try and do well. Um, I would say that I was very lucky that the partners who, so for example, the gaming uh, work I did, that partner joined in an acquisition of another firm that joined Michigan's during my training contract. So there were lots of like, there was a, a confluence of good events that helped me. Um, but um, that partner was called Nick Nocton, an amazing gaming lawyer, and um, was incredibly patient with a very overexcited and uh, not particularly great attention to detail trainee, if I'm honest. Um, uh, but actually, I always thought that that kind of open relationship in terms of transparent conversation where someone can give you feedback really constructively, but in a way where you're going to really listen to it is actually more important than someone who might even have better advice, but is delivering it in a way that you're not open to hearing. Um, and that's because they understand you as a person, and you understand them as a person. And the other effect of that is when you let them down, you feel it. Right. So if, if someone if someone's just absolutely beasting you as a trainee, when it goes wrong, you may be annoyed at yourself, but you're not necessarily disappointed for letting them down. When you've got a great mentor or a great teacher, you just want to do right by them. Um, and when I hire trainees now or paralegals or even junior lawyers, what I look for is not just coachability, but that sort of dynamic that am I going to learn from this person because they eventually will develop a skill set and knowledge that I'll be able to learn from? And at this stage, can they learn from me? Not just because of what we each know, but because of the dynamic we're going to be able to build. So I think that was a really important sort of lens for which to, to look when sort of crafting your training contract, your career generally. Yeah, I, I love that. And I think that kind of smart decision making in a way because you're surrounding yourself with with people that you know have have a lot of wisdom who have a lot of careers advice that they can share which then enables you to you know you gel with these people you find people you have a good fit a good synergy with and it just you know you feel a lot more confident in your decision but like you rightly said it sort of holds you more accountable because you don't want to let these people down you want to bring out the absolute best of yourself so in the same breath you're going to get even more out of that particular training contract because you're surrounding yourself around people you want to do well with so really like that um you touched on again before why um, you wanted to leave private practice to maybe go and in and house again? Just go a bit deeper. What what prompted that? And how could you? What advice would you give to people who might be thinking of trying to do the same? And you know, similarities, differences, things. Like that? Yeah, I mean, 
now you are seeing a lot more interesting ways to structure the cost to a client. But even you know, eight, 10 years ago, the likelihood of your normal deal structure for billing something to a client being a fixed fee arrangement or a success fee or whatever it may be, it was much thinner on the ground in terms of the reality. And I had a fundamental issue with that quite quickly because I realized that trainee time is often the first time to be written off. And that's an active disincentivization to the trainee putting in more time and more work. It's maybe an incentive to be more efficient. But the thing is, when you're a trainee, you're still learning the skills. It's very hard to be as efficient when you don't know the base subject matter as well. A lot of it is, hey, I really want to deep dive into this. But the answer is, well, you're deep diving into it on the client's time because they're paying you by you know, the billable six minutes. And so you're either having to do off the books time, which the partner's always telling you not to do, or you're doing it on the books and then they write it off and then you get reprimanded. So I think what really drove me to in-house quite quickly was this idea that in-house is an environment where as long as you're still delivering sort of on time, because I, I, my problem in private practice wasn't with the issue of delivering by a fixed date. It's that within the time frame until that fixed date, I still had to be economical with how much time I was spending on something. So I was never a very good sleeper. But if I wanted to work till one in the morning, it's because I was interested in a subject. I couldn't, or at least not be honest about it. And I thought that was silly because I've got a curious mind and I value people with curious minds. And I can't replicate 20 years of knowledge over a subject matter if I don't put the time in. So um, that was quite obvious quite quickly. I will say now, though, law firms are being more flexible with their fee arrangements or more creative, at least. And not to mention things like legal tech, which is one of the things that interests me, basically increase efficiencies. So they allow more junior people to not spend as much time on bundling documents or doing large DD exercises and all these kinds of things that are historically ultra time consuming and typically the remit of a junior lawyer but free them up from a sort of work-life balance perspective and a quality of work perspective to do more interesting things, basically. Yeah, I, I love that. I and mean, we, we need to now talk about legal tech because you are the GC of, of Luminance, you know, the world's most advanced AI technology for processing legal document platform. Tell us more about Luminance. Tell us more about your current role. How does it feel to have that title? I'll start at the end because, I mean, I am quite a young GC and it's fantastic to have that vote of confidence. I came in with a head of legal title. Practically, my job's the same. But it, it was a, a vote of confidence from our board, our investors, the rest of the, uh, you know, our CEO, Eleanor, is a young CEO. She put me forward for that promotion. It was fantastic. Um, and validation, I think, at any stage in your career is lovely. Um, what I will say about Luminance is, essentially, Luminance started as a uh, a mathematical algorithmic problem studied by a couple of boffins at Cambridge, basically. And then, you know, as these things often happen, they thought, oh, we've got something here, but what's the application? I.e., something that can algorithmically understand conceptual meaning of words rather than words per se. So in the example of you know liability is the conceptual possibility that the absence of a limitation of liability clause means that there is unlimited liability. So you don't actually have to have the words unlimited liability for it to conceptually understand. It understands that absence means something. It understands that one word can be conceptually similar to another. These things are much more common now, now that you know, there's shiny new object syndrome with the uh, generative AI. But six, seven years ago, when Luminous was founded, this was absolutely revolutionary. And it's also revolutionary because of its applications, because it initially started being applied to due diligence exercises and e-discovery. So large document reviews that law firms do all the time, companies do all the time to stand millions of documents, maybe to figure out, hey, is there conceptually this word in there? Is there this risk? What's the value of all these contracts? Basically, all these millions of data points that you might want to find out in a contract and convert like raw words into usable reports, which is basically what due diligence exercises were about and the discovery exercises were about. Um, but more consistently than if you had to have 10 paralegals who all have slightly different perceptions of words and slightly different approaches and maybe different backgrounds, and maybe they haven't had enough sleep that night or had a great time the night before, you know, all, all these things. Um, but Luminance, well, the reason they sort of brought me on is because we had a, our new CEO join 
couple of years ago. And her and the rest of the team, and we've grown hugely since then, said, well, we've got this core AI that has this conceptual understanding. How can we use this in a different market? And, you know, this is also sort of a careers and business podcast. And there's, there's a business lesson here, which is sometimes you don't need to look for the shiny new tool. You've sometimes already got the tool. You just need to think about how to use it best. Um, and it was the in-house angle, because essentially, if you are using a tool that can analyze static documents, that's really a tool that has some use in-house. I, I've got all these deals. You know, I might be a huge company with millions of contracts. I want to know how much all those contracts are worth, when they terminate, all these kinds of things. But what's more useful than that is actually I'm doing the day-to-day -day negotiating of my contracts, right? So if I've got millions of my own contracts as a data point, plus out-of-the-box learning that Luminance has from its own data, then how can I apply that to my live negotiations, right? So the principle, which has really driven the business hugely in the last two years, is what we call our corporate product, which basically means that if I'm opening Microsoft Word, I click the plugin and it comes up traffic lit, red, yellow, green, red, you've never accepted this ever, this looks crazy, um, you, you, like, you've never even conceptually seen this before. Yellow, you've accepted this sometimes, but you know, this is, you've accepted this in NDAs, but you've not accepted this in a contract of monetary value, maybe you want to look at this again. Green, you've always accepted this. Right, conceptually, which is useful because it doesn't need to be the exact word. And the reason this has been so good for Luminance is because our average user isn't necessarily a lawyer. Because if you're a procurement team, for example, right, and your legal team is still involved, you know, we often have this conversation about is AI going to replace lawyers? No, lawyers plus AI become a more useful business tool because the lawyers set the parameters. The lawyers are constantly reviewing and checking they're happy with what the latest regulatory regime is reflected in those contract processes. But if you've set up the parameters of what you like at an NDA and what you don't, and a procurement team who's sending out maybe thousands of NDAs a month, depending on the size of your company, and some of our customers do do that, um, then you, know, you receive a third-party NDA, it comes up all green. Your legal team has essentially pre-approved that. So you don't have to go to lawyers. So legal is happy because their workload is lighter, but they're still visibly valuable. But the procurement team's happy because they haven't had to go to the legal team. And everyone likes the legal team they don't have to speak to. Yeah, absolutely. And an interesting fact, I, before I set up my own legal recruiting business, I, ha I did a re procurement recruitment. So I always say about the procurement v. lawyer uh, intersect is, is, is quite interesting. Yeah, I know, I know it well. It's sort of MSIPs versus the uh, law qualified. It's, it's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> it's an interesting. For me, the most interesting aspect of it was this obviously means that the lawyer is getting more um, intrinsically involved in the day-to-day -day of what the AI is interpreting. And so I got brought in for this really exciting role because essentially I'm sort of an internal legal feedback loop. Like we use Luminance to negotiate our contracts with our clients, all this kind of stuff. So I work every day with our head of product, with our CTO, with our COO. How can we develop this product that works better for this particular type of client can we how how useful and scalable is this to multiple clients that sort of like legal feedback loop um and also sort of driving if we're going to prioritize this legal understanding versus that legal understanding what's more common and really only someone who's actually been in practice uh, can advise that so it's a really odd role for a lawyer because it's sort of like a third of the job is sort of just tech advisory rather than legal work. And that's great because I've never seen a legal role quite like it. And I've recently been speaking to a couple of other sort of legal tech GCs um, and they seem to have a very similar experience. There aren't many of us uh, yet. I'm sure there will be many, many more. But for now, it's still a relatively small number globally and they all have very similar uh, positive experiences. No, and I like that. It's, it's variety as well. Time for a short break from the show. Are you still relying on spreadsheets to manage your legal matters? There's a better way to work. Our sponsor, Clio, is the cloud-based legal software that will transform the way your law firm operates. They offer legal practice management and client onboarding software that doesn't cost the earth. In fact, from as little as £49 per month, you can cut out all of those tedious admin tasks that you dread doing each week, each month. Automate the boring stuff, free up more time for the important stuff, that's what you get with Clio. Your clients will thank you for it, your bank account will thank you for it, your colleagues will thank you for it, and you can even thank me later for telling you all about it. So head to clio.com 
forward slash legally speaking to see how Clio can help you. That's C L I O dot com forward slash legally speaking. Now back to the show. So I want to ask you this question that you're in the role now. If you were to hand that role over to somebody at the end of whenever that is for you, what do you want that to look like? And maybe what I'm getting at is here, I tend to say to everyone, we have nothing but a legacy. So what do you want the legacy for you as the GC at Luminance to be? How would you like that to be handed over? What do you want to have achieved? That is a question that no one has ever asked me before, Rob. Uh, well, there's two aspects to this. There's, there's the state of the company and there's the state of the role, right? And the state of the company, you know, like any burgeoning tech company with an exciting product, you want the company to grow huge, who knows, IPO, whatever, the, the, all the lovely things that everyone wants from a high growth tech company. But in terms of the legal team, you know, I benefited enormously from great mentors and I benefited enormously from people just willing to give me their time. And so what I would like Luminance's legal team to look like, the GC role handover, to be where there is a pr- appropriately sized, well-trained, happy and collaborative legal function where everyone has a I don't actually like very siloed legal teams I know when you get to a certain size some kind of siloing is required but you know you might need like an IP litigator or whatever it might be but broadly I want most people to be doing most of the work that's split around the company be able to pick up whatever they can but then be able to carve out their niches be able to have specialties so that they feel individually valued like one of my trainees, for example, she loves data protection. Another one of my trainees loves corporate work. Um, and thankfully, they are completely different things that they're interested in. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a default when something comes in. I offer it to both of them just in case the other one wants to dip in. If they don't, then I'm allowing them to specialize, but I'm still making them do the general commercial work of the business, maybe the odd bit of employment or whatever it might be. And I think that sort of well-rounded legal team who all speak to each other and are connected so a really good communication i think is key because i don't want to be in a position where i hand over a legal team one day maybe and people don't know what the state of the business is they don't know where things are thankfully we have legal tech tools that support that which is great but it's a well-oiled team is kind of what you want not just a minimum viable product team that keeps growing at minimum viable product you want to be even if that means you know i'm working through the night on the sort of conceptual problems of how do i uh reward this person so that they are interested in doing this particular project or taking on someone they can train themselves and then we have continuity so we don't lose people you know long retention is a good thing in in legal teams but that doesn't mean that you are retaining them through the same track doing one thing and i think people often think of retention as um essentially a, a, a a pseudo word for keeping someone doing what they're doing. And that's not what I want. I want to create a track where people can continue to progress. They're able to train someone to take over their role and you have a continuous linear growth. So as the top end uh, specializes, the bottom end can keep growing and more people can learn from the people who've already gone through the experience. So yeah, I think that's where I love us to be. Um, But hopefully I won't be on the way out anytime soon. No, absolutely. And I, I love that. And I love that you talk about collaboration. And I love you make a great point about retention. So I'd say it's very, very expensive if you don't have the right retention strategy in place. And I always say only retain if they can gain. There's no point trying to retain someone in a box indefinitely. It's not going to happen. They need to gain. They need to grow. And I love that you, you talk about that. So I want to come to taking mine back to November 2022 when you attended the Economist General Council Summit. And in your Luminance blog, you discussed with regulation constantly changing and consumer priorities shifting accordingly, AI provides a swifter ESG reporting process. So how are in-house legal teams using Luminance AI to address specifically ESG in their companies or firms? Sure, yeah. I mean, first of all, that was a terrifying conference because I was on a stage. <laughs> I was on a stage with the GC of Rolls-Royce and the GC of Booking.com. And I was like, I have massive imposter syndrome right now. But anyway, it was fabulous. Um, yes, I mean, what, this actually came up from an audience question where they said, you know, we're discussing about how data can be extracted from your documents. And 
ESG, it's easy to pay lip service and, you know, talk about the word greenwashing is used quite a lot. Um, But if you actually genuinely believe in uh, sort of equity and inclusion amongst your employees, if you believe in genuinely having suppliers that follow proper ESG practices, then the only way you can actually systematically understand what your position is and how good you are being and how you can do better is by having a good optic over everything that's going on in your business. So if you are an enormous company with millions of contracts and potentially thousands of employees or even hundreds of thousands of employees, being able to understand um, how many of your uh, contracts are including specific annexes that have ESG requirements, for example, is a really good way of demonstrating not only to your employees that in the business you do, you care about um, your process, but you also aren't just paying lip service to it, you are actioning them. But you can also say, actually, we're not doing as well as we thought we were doing on this, and we can do better. Maybe we should actually send out an amendment to all our suppliers asking them to commit to something for us. The only way you'll know to do that is by actually seeing what's, what the lay of the land currently is. So whether it's ESG requirements, data protection compliance, because you know ESG is such a broad term. The G is often under, under discussed, the governance, right? And a big part of governance is sort of compliance functionality. So how do you care about your consumer's data, your client's data, et cetera? Well, one of the few ways you can do that is by checking, do I have appropriate data protection contractual requirements on my suppliers and my clients um, in my contracts? If I've got millions of contracts, especially if I'm a data-heavy company, figuring that out is a large DD exercise, essentially internally, and using luminance and legal technology that can analyze conceptual meaning in, what, in uh, text, you're able to determine that and then more importantly, action it. Uh, the, the really important thing here is it doesn't matter if it's luminance or legal tech generally, doesn't do anything on its own. It still requires a human action and a human will to then take a next step. Because if you've just figured out you've got a massive problem, but then you don't take a step to resolve it, or you've figured out that you could be doing better at something you're already doing quite well, but there's actually scope to do better, doesn't really matter unless you actually take that step yeah great great advice yeah and i know more about that i always say to people as well actually take those steps and i love that you know you speak very passionately about that and you rightly say the emphasis on the g sometimes does get missed so i, I like that you included that i want to take a break from legal tech careers and talk about something that's very important because you and i are both forums so we must talk about our dash hounds most of our listeners know that I have a chocolate dash hound called Otto, who features a lot on my uh, content, also known as Prince Otto to me in the house. But I believe you also have a dash hound who is the office dog. So can you tell us his name and the joy that he genuinely brings to the, to the office? First of all, Arnie is the joy of my life. <laughs> I hope my partner doesn't hear that, but she, he's also the joy of her life. So... <laughs> But I remember when we when I came to Luminance, I was in the office three or so days a week. And I actually love being in the office because I like being in the buzz. I sort of missed it after the pandemic. I really like being with colleagues. And I said, the only reason I can't be in the office more is because I've got to, my partner and I are alternating dog, doggy daycare duty essentially at home. And our lease didn't allow dogs. And our CEO very bluntly said, well, you're the lawyer, sort it out. Uh, <laughs> so I negotiated with our landlord, had signed all kinds of waivers and things. He's like named on the lease, all this kind of stuff. And yeah, he's, a, he's turning six next month. Um, he is fabulous. Arnie, he's also actually the way I met my partner as well. I, met, I was walking in the street when he was a puppy and then the rest is history. But um, Arnie has his little bed next to my desk in the office whenever someone's had a busy or long day they can come in and just hang out with arnie he loves people um he's the best yeah he's a chocolate dappled dachshund uh and features increasingly on luminance's uh social media and posts but also um i I actually was in an article recently in the lawyer and he even got a shout out in that so yeah he is the best how old is otto did you say 
Otto's two, so he's got a bit of a bit of catching up to do. So he's uh, still rebellious. He has snuck into the lawyer before, but he needs to uh, he needs to get a bit more uh, legal legal PR. But I I think you, you managed. I love how you managed to link that to a legal story as well of how you managed to negotiate a contract and uh, make sure that you can ensure that your dog can work in your place. There's some proves everything is possible, folks. Arnie's a very hard nosed negotiator himself, so he's got <laughs> he's got the puppy eyes to make it work. Yeah. And at, he gets fed every day at about five o'clock. And at four o'clock, you can always just see him sort of giving everyone sort of the puppy eyes, like someone's going to feed me in the next hour. I don't really care who it is, but someone showed me some time. Yeah, absolutely. I, it's, it also also has five o'clock feeding time. So there we go. But we must go back to technology in AI because it is an important discussion. Um, they are continued to develop at a rapid pace. What should legal teams and law firms be aware of. so i sort of split ai there's a like the buzzword at the moment is around generative ai but generative ai isn't really the primary use case for most legal processes most of what i'll choose my words carefully here because actually i think plenty of lawyers give advice and you do give lots of advice but actually i think if most lawyers look at what they do most of the day they are analyzing thinking and then converting that into advice right so asking even a generative ai tool a, a final question that it can then help you resolve is still on the basis of the analytical understanding you've had to create first. So if you've got uh, you know, a million documents and you want to have an understanding of what's in them, and then once you've got that understanding, you want to use generative AI to help you solve that problem, there's sort of two steps there. So I kind of always split between analytical AI and generative AI. Generative AI is increasing at a pace. Analytical AI, one of the reasons I'm so passionate about Luminance is it's something that Luminance focuses in and specializes in, but actually is in many ways harder because generative AI can essentially draw words from an enormous data set and create new words, i.e. the advice it's giving you from that basis. The problem is, is that unless you can get rid of any possible hallucinations, words that are used a lot about generative AI, false advice, or biases, or... Um, several other potential issues with generative AI, you still then need to look at it analytically and maybe using analytical AI. So I thought of analytical AI first, generative AI second in terms of where we are currently in the landscape. I think that probably continues and eventually you end up in a point where both have a lot of utility. My main concern actually really with generative AI is about sort of data privacy, biases, the social issues that may arise with that, and also the level of confidence and false positives that generative AI may provide. Um, and I think at the end of the day, even if a piece of generative AI gives an ordinary person a piece of advice, realistically, if it's important, especially if you know that there are hallucinations, then probably want to get that signed off by a lawyer anyway. So yes, I would, but may, I'm a lawyer, so I'm probably quite risk averse. So I do think you know, the pace is enormous in generative AI. So I do think probably in the next couple of years, we might be having a very different conversation than we're having today. But for now, I think analytical AI is very proven. Lots of companies have, not even in the legal tech space, but in the tech space generally, use analytical AI in a bunch of different ways. And that's very proven, very trusted, and is an assistance tool in the same way that generative AI can assist you to a process, but you can't quite trust the foundation on which that process is built. Whereas analytical AIs, sort of, especially when it's sort of supervised machine learning, they can be steered towards the parameters very clearly that you want without any hallucinations because you can describe the data sets quite easily. And I don't want to get too into the, the, the geekiness of it. But yes, I think analytical for now, generative pretty soon. There we go. Stick with analytical for now, folks. You, you've heard it here from, uh, from Harry's side. Um, Harry, I also want to, before we sort of look to, to, to close, I want to ask, because you do a lot of giving back and an event, and you were on the panel um, not so long ago with the London Young Lawyers Group, uh, Alternative Legal Career Roots. So what advice would you share with aspiring lawyers thinking of a career in the legal profession, in legal tech, or becoming a legal counsel, or switching if in industry now? Yeah, I, I, I'm i very lucky to be involved in uh, various education groups. I'm, I do some lecturing and I'm very passionate about that. And I love working with London Young Lawyers. And broadly, other than sort of the subject specific stuff I teach, you know, at University of Law or wherever it may be, um, when I'm talking more holistically about career advice, 
Um, first of all, I don't think there's a one size fits all. And I think people are always trying to follow someone else's path. And I think that's part of the problem. I think acquiring mentors where possible is really important because a good mentor doesn't tell you just what they did, but they, t- or they often tell you, you don't necessarily need to do what I do, but this is why I did what I did. Do you think similarly about what you want? And if not, I'm actually giving you something you can disregard because sometimes it's also hard to know what not to listen to. Um, I think early in your career, and this is very easy to say, but is a reality, I think people can often get overly focused on how much they could potentially earn early in their career. And that drives them down a career path that they then want to pivot later. That can work, but you may be sort of, once you get on that track, it's maybe harder to get off it. I think often being honest with yourself as early as possible about what you think you might want and also the reality that you might change your mind several times in your career is good because you're not going to stress and panic later when you do. It's always part of the plan. And I think that's really important because you often hear um, from, I'm very lucky to be on panels all the time with amazing people. And the thing I often see with them, especially in the legal tech space, but you know, um, people who start their own law firms, all kinds of things, is that this is never part of the plan and it was really stressful, but I just knew I couldn't do what I was doing anymore. I wanted to do something else. And often it's they were only doing the thing they were doing in the first place because they'd set themselves an idea of what they should be doing. Um, I think if you can step away from that and just think about there's this world of options out there, let me find something that's probably quite transferable. Let me find something that really speaks to what's of interest to me right now and then I can shift over to then I think that's going to be probably the best path to finding the sort of real you career path, quote unquote, rather than just the track that's there because you think you should be going down. Yeah, really like that advice. And as as cheesy as it sounds, I say if you dissect the word career, you should care very deeply about what you do. And I think it's super important to have a career, something you care about, passionate about. And like you say, it's not, you know, I don't not met anyone who says their, their career has gone in such a straight line. Um, because there will be sort of some some ducks and weeds along the way. So finally, Harry, if our listeners want to learn more about Luminance, all the courses that you teach that you mentioned there, where can they find out? Yeah, so luminance.com is a good place to go. And we've got loads of information about Luminance on our website, particularly some demos. It's very easy to set up. We always do free pilots. So anyone's welcome to take a test run of the product for um, several weeks. And we encourage people to use it as much as possible because I think if you've got a good product, you should encourage people to sort of test the pressure. Um, In terms of teaching, I'm working closely with Barbary on the PSC course. They do fantastic work. I also teach on the commercial drafting course with Flex Legal with an amazing recruitment company. They do amazing work for trainees. And I think they do great work in the legal community. And I'm very lucky to also be uh, working with Queen Mary on their legal tech course as well. So I'm looking forward to um, continuing working with students and young lawyers, hopefully for many years to come. Absolutely. And I'm sure a lot of them are going to want to follow you or get in touch about some of the things you've discussed today. It's been very thought provoking. What's the best way for them to contact you? Feel free to shout out any social media handles or website links. We'll also share them with this episode for you too. Yeah, I'm just very easy to reach on LinkedIn. That's probably the best. Uh, Harry Borovic on LinkedIn. Um, I love receiving DMs from students where I've spoken. Uh, anyone who wants to reach out and be connected to good mentorship schemes, etc., or learn more about AI and luminance, reach out to me on LinkedIn. It'd be great to hear from whoever wants to speak. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Harry. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. We'd like to wish you lots of continued success with your future pursuits and indeed making sure that legacy happens. But for now, from all of us on the Legal Team Podcast, over and out. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. If you like the content here, why not check out our world-leading content and collaboration hub, the Legally Speaking Club, over on Discord. Go to our website, www.legallyspeakingpodcast.com for the link to join our community there. Over and out.